Yeah, that was a strange yeah. thing. I thought when when I first noticed the the trend that uh, yeah. atheism was following, I was confused as to yeah. why we were. I think that, right. that the British term is losing the plot. You know, yeah. I mean, we we completely lost yeah. our target. I mean, so why are we why are we turning turning ships and cannons toward our yeah. own fleet? Yeah. I mean, what the hell's going on there? Welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. Today I will be joined by the YouTube personality and atheist campaigner Aaron Ra. I've been a follower and a fan for some time now, so it was really great to get a chance to talk to Aaron Ra. And as a little bit of backstory to this conversation, One of the things I wanted to talk to him about is we both had a shared experience, him on a much larger scale than me, of generating a big backlash for self-identifying as feminists in atheist spaces. It turns out, if you're not deeply enmeshed in this world, which you might not be, that in online atheism, there are many, many... uh, atheists who are very, very hostile to even the word feminist. So, some time ago, I published an article on a blog with, at most, maybe a few hundred followers, called Atheists Should Be Feminists, and I posted it in a couple of discussion groups, and it generated, within an hour, thousands of comments, almost all of them negative, attacking me for really everything under the sun. And so, when I reached out to Aron Ra, I mentioned this because he had a very similar experience on a much larger scale. He gave a talk five years ago where he self-identified as a feminist, which was a very reasonable and thought out, as well as quite a funny talk, and endured just a ridiculous and disproportionate backlash from many people within the atheist community online. So I wanted to talk to him about that and some of the things we had thrown at us and what our response to all of it was. If you've been following the podcast up to this point, you'll notice that I'm kind of alternating. I've been talking to both philosophers and public figures. So this is definitely more on the applied side. We're talking about how different political values operate in the real world here. Coming up, we'll definitely have uh, more philosophers on for those of you who are more fans of the more theoretic stuff. But I think one of the fun things about political philosophy is it does breach that gap between the applied and the practical. And I'm quite happy to, to move between the two. One note for listening to this interview is we were joined by an additional guest, Aaron Ra's pet parrot, Max. So Max uh, didn't want to leave his owner's side for this interview, and he chimes in every now and again with a squawk. Um, I personally imagine that he's agreeing with us and saying, right on, or maybe this is a Texan parrot, so hell yeah, in concurrence with everything that we're saying. So if you're wondering what that is, uh, we we do have an additional guest at some points. One final thing before we get to the interview is if you like and support Aaron Ra's work, please do follow him and support him on Patreon. I'll link to that on my website. He's a full-time campaigner for atheist rights. And actually, if I were to point to the big figures in atheism, I think he stayed truest to the original mission, which is what I signed up for, of fighting for atheist rights fighting against discrimination, fighting on the local level step by step against theocratic encroachment, be it teaching creationism in schools or, you know, getting statues of the Ten Commandments taken down. He really is doing, I almost said the Lord's work, (laughs) he's fighting the good fight, so please do support him. And he's also an individual who I think has consistently shown himself to be brave, Before we came on the podcast, we discussed our shared experience 
generating really extreme and hysterical blowback for discussing feminism in atheist spaces. And I just asked him, hey, are you ready to march back into that just storm of BS? And Aaron Ra, without any pause, without any lack of confidence, but at the same time without any bravado at all, simply said, and I can't do the accent, she simply said, yeah. One word. So, I think that tells you what you need to know about the guy. Now, that was a little bit of a long introduction, but with that as preamble, it is my absolute pleasure to present Aaron Ra. I am joined today by Aaron Ra. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. So we're going to venture into some dangerous waters today. Before we do, for those who might not know you, how would you describe what you do these days? I am the uh, Southwest Regional Director of American Atheists. I've been a, a science communicator and a, and a secular activist for uh, at least a decade now. Uh, I, I started with the Foundational Falsehoods of Creationism, which is a video series that was then turned into a book that's, that's done quite well. And, uh, and then yeah, this is, has now become my full-time gig. And uh, it, I'm, I'm uh, excited that I can do what I love to do as a living. That's a great thing. But uh, when you, my, my goal, of course, is to affect actual change, to make a meaningful difference. And so that means like policy change. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do is trying to get like, you know, part of the atheist out program, you know, get, getting people to identify as atheists would be a good idea because we are not recognized as a, as a demographic. We are at least uh, a, a quarter of the country, though most atheists would not identify as such. I mean, they, they tend to avoid the A word as much as they can, and they call themselves any number of other things instead. Uh, but if you, if you, Read the polls on uh, people who don't have a religion, don't believe in a god, don't consider religion to be important. You know, every criteria that would describe what an atheist is, there's at least a quarter of the country is us. And yet, we, we, we outnumber Jews, of course, we outnumber Catholics, we outnumber pretty much everybody except uh, Protestant Christians. And yet we don't have any representation in our government at all. We are the most hated demographic. So that most people would not even consider voting for an atheist. It's the lowest of, if you ask people, would you vote for an otherwise qualified X category of persons? It's the lowest of, it's, it's, I remember seeing one thing where it wasn't only lower than like radical Muslims. I remember seeing one poll where it was lower than rapists. Like people would vote <laughs> for a rapist before they yeah, would vote the for an thing atheist. About that is the strange thing about that is, is what does win in politics is, is the craziest of people. I mean, it, it should be that if you think that snakes and donkeys can talk and, and you think that these are the end times, then you have no business, you know, planning my future if you don't think I have one. You know, but what we, what we should be voting for, what the people we should be electing, or at least considering, is if you're going to be electing a, a judge or, a, or a, a, a representative in our government, then you want somebody who isn't strong in their convictions and firm in their beliefs you, because those people have already judged your case before they heard the evidence and they're not going to change their minds. So yeah. you're voting for the most unreasonable person. You want the most open-minded person you can get. Somebody who actually, you know, who, who won't make a determination until they understand what the facts are. Someone who will question whether they understand that accurately or adequately to make a judgment, you know, and, and these are seen somehow as a sign of weakness. Yeah. That somehow being honest and fair is somehow a sign of weakness in, in representative government. I don't get that. So there's the, also this thing which you alluded to, though, which is there's a huge disconnect between simply not wanting to believe things on insufficient evidence, which, like you say, a quarter, who knows, are of this country subscribe to, and the label atheist. And... 
when you say atheist, people automatically think that they know X many dozen things about you, many of them negative. Um, and one of the things I find really ironic, which is what I wanted to talk to you today about, is despite being the victims of essentially just a colossal societal straw man, it seems to me that the atheist community is in the business of doing that to other groups in almost exactly the same way without any self-awareness. And the one that both me and you have got in trouble for is the F word, feminism. It seems like in exactly the same way most or some large percentage of the country will say they support women's equality, but as soon as you mention that word, just you, you've opened the floodgates to just a deluge of misapprehensions and misunderstandings and perhaps intentional misunderstandings. Yeah, that was a strange thing. I thought when when I first noticed the, the trend that uh, atheism was following, I was confused as to why we were, I think that, that the British term is losing the plot. You know, I mean, we we completely lost our target. I mean, so why are we why are we turning turning ships and cannons toward our own fleet? I mean, what the hell's going on there? You know, it, to to me, I mean, one of the many things that religion got wrong, you know, is how all of the religion religions oppress women. So it's no surprise that a lot of people you know come to feminism through a hatred of religion and a religious impression. And one would think that those, those two would go hand in hand, that, that if you're going to object to religion, of course, you're going to object to what it does to women. And I don't just mean Christianity. I don't just mean Abrahamic religion. I mean, my we were married, my wife and I were married in a Buddhist temple because it happens to be a really nice setting to do that sort of thing. And uh, when we made those arrangements, my wife tried to, to shake the guy's hand as a thank you, and, and he backed away from her like she was made of kryptonite. You know, because she's a woman and you can't physically touch a woman. So, you know, this, this is the Buddhist reaction. You know, and every every religion seems to have this this horrible adversity and, and where, where they, they where they deny women their, their rights to speak or to or to have any authority, anything. And, you know, most of uh, most of the, the repression we've had in the laws of the legal system in this country have come from religious attitudes. You know, and there's no justification behind it. So if you if you really want to be completely anti-religious, you, you're of course going to take that aspect too. So I was a bit confused when the atheists are turning on you know, wh why they hate feminists. How did feminists get to be the target of anything? You know, if you want to complain about you know what somebody said or complain, you know, make fun of how they look or whatever. I don't I don't understand how that that becomes a target. So I gave a speech once where. Uh, I identified as a feminist, and the, the, I explained exactly what I meant. I said that, uh, you know, that that I was a, a little kid when I remember hearing uh, ridiculous things like, you know, Gloria Steinem, uh, the, the, the editor of uh, a woman's magazine back in the back in the 1970s. Uh, she was considered at the time, or said to be at the time, you know, to be a man-hating bull dyke, for example. I mean, anybody that was a women's liber or a feminist at the time was you know, supposedly hating on men and wanting to oppress men. And it was all the same bullshit arguments that we hear now today. And when the arguments haven't changed. They haven't gotten any better. You know, and so when I say that in 1970, as in 7-0, you know, that I'm, you know, like uh, 11 years old or whatever, and, and, um, and I identify this way, well, it's somehow people have turned that into that I'm a third wave feminist, which yeah, that started in 1996. So I don't know how I could have been a third wave feminist in 1970. And then they say that, you know, and if I say that uh, that I, I don't agree with the religious oppression and I think women should have uh, social, economic, and political equality, you know, and the the, the real trouble there is the social aspect of it. You know, you know, rethinking on how you know how we don't treat women differently for being, say, promiscuous if they are, for example. You know, you don't do the you know, the, the uneven treatment there. People wanted to turn that into a religion. So I'm constantly, I'm constantly being attacked for having, for believing in the religion of feminism what, because... What in Christ is that about? Because I got this I as well. I imagine. I, 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 I was to... told you're believing in stuff without evidence in exactly the same way as religious people or flat earthers. And no, no, this is, this is not a empirical claim about the world. It's a values claim. We should treat women with the same way we treat men. That's, yeah, that's and, a, then I was, yeah. and then I was told that the definition that I'm using is not 
the real yeah. definition. I mean, so I, so I actually yeah. contacted a number of these groups, and I, I tried to arrange a, a meeting yeah. between them, but I could. But the, the, the president of one of these uh, organizations couldn't find any available time yeah. to do it. Uh, but it was like the National Organization of Women and uh, a handful of others. I think I had like four different organizations. They all use exactly the same definition that I do. You know, that it is, you know, the, you know, the belief in the social, economic and political equality, that sort of thing. You either, you know, you, you, if you agree with that, then by definition, you're feminist. And that's, that, that was the thing that I said that pissed everybody off because they want to say that they believe that. But but they, 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 as long as they don't use that word, for whatever reason, you can call it anything else, and then they're okay, seemingly. And I don't I don't understand what what okay then don't use the label then what difference does it make? Yeah, but even <laughs> but here's what's funny is if you try a different tack and you say okay I think we should be f- for the social equality of women then they'll turn around to you and go oh but that sounds a bit like feminism. so you can't you can't win and my point that i've been making to no obvious success is not that there's necessarily a logical connection per se you can be atheist and a feminist you can be atheist and sexist there's you can be atheist and anything atheism is just not believing in the ridiculous but the atheists of all people should be aware of what it's like to have your category, your label, really viciously strawmanned. Like, because that, it happens to us. Like, what's the gap between people who don't believe in God and people who call themselves atheists, right? And that gap exists because the label itself is so toxic to so many people. So how close do we need to hold the mirror to your average anti-feminist atheist, for the, them to see themselves in it. Yeah, you well, know, that was that, uh, that was a common argument that I used. I mean, when you know, people they understand that you don't have to use the label atheist for it to apply. If you don't believe in God, then you're atheist, and it doesn't matter if you use that label. But for whatever reason, the definition of feminism doesn't seem to work that way. So you know, well, if you if you believe that you know if if you believe in endorse support you know the idea that women should have social, political, and economic equality with men, then that makes you feminist. But they have to, they, as as you said, they have to strawman it into something else. And I've heard all these people say that that feminism is really about women dominating men, or women hating men, or women imposing rules against men that that no one ever imposed. You know, and and one of the other common strawman the, the things that I get is. There was a thing once upon a time where there was one group that wanted to uh, create a, a subset within atheism. They wanted to do atheism plus, and that was supposed to be atheism plus social justice. And I remember everybody seems to, to assist, insist, and for years, I mean, this was like five years ago, and, and the whole time ever since, uh, people would would uh, challenge me on any kind of a interview where there would be you know public contribution. They would say, well, why do you support atheism plus? Never I'd, did. I'd never even heard of it. People, yeah, I've people, ne- I'd never supported it ever. People, so why is why I didn't does even know ask me what it was? And yeah, people, people kept going, "Oh, you're one of those atheism plus types," and I'm like, "I I yeah, don't know what this is. Yeah, I had to I'm, I'm research on video. it." I'm on video, right when the atheism plus movement began, I was, I was at I was at a conference in Colorado, and there was a panel of people representing. Uh, they, they were all part of the atheism plus thing, and I I was uh, on video saying that I don't identify with this label, you know that uh, that I I would just rather like to you know call myself progressive, than than to to use this other label that I didn't think was unnecessary. So clearly I'm not supporting that. I've distanced myself and separated myself from that, and yet for five years everybody keeps challenging me on why do I support? No, I obviously never did. So it's it's uh, it's an absurdity. It's not even something I ever talk about. I mean, the only time I ever mentioned feminism is when people brought up that I mentioned the, that I identified with the F word five years ago, and really, that's that's it. And so they have to. I, mean, I have been called uh, a strong arm. You know, one guy made a video with one hugely popular guy on YouTube made a video calling me a strong arm for atheism plus, even though I. No, I, I, <laughs> you know, I denounced that title on day one. So where the hell is that coming from? At a, at a certain point, you just have to laugh. I mean, my experience was much smaller scale than yours, but I still got, and this was on a blog, which, by the way, maybe got two or three hundred views normally. Like, it wasn't big. And I got, 
it was it was like well, up to ten thousand towards the end. Just I think people reacting to the title alone, mm. and. One of them, I remember it to this day, it was so good. Someone said, and there's a certain poetry to the language. You may not think it, but you are every bit as bad as Hitler. Your eyes are blind to the evil that your hands sow. And that's just beautiful. That's an amazing thing to have said about you. And for just the most, <laughs> for the most modest argument. And I did a podcast um, about a month back with Callie Ann Mendoza, who's the former Amnesty International field director, and what we tried to argue was that social, and we really did try to separate ourselves from the more extreme, shall we say, social justice people. Um, all we tried to say was that we think the essential normative thrust of social justice movements in terms of sexism is still a real thing and a problem, racism is still a real thing and a problem, homophobia is still a real thing and a problem, and we should try and do something about it. Our position was that that is a valid position, we agree with this, and we support that. And we also really went out of our way to say the people who are really, the people who I think these people have in mind, the people who are very extreme, who get very confrontational with it, are not helping. If nothing else, like taking a very aggressive approach to social justice, it just isn't strategic. And we really tried our best to put something out there that a reasonable person could listen to and go, you know what, I've heard negative things about feminists or social justice warriors, but you know, what these guys are saying made sense. We really made every effort to appeal to the middle ground. And what I got back was people essentially saying, I'm not even willing to listen to it. Not because I don't have time, but what, what they said was, well, that's not what I see coming from feminism or social justice, and I'm only going to listen once you know, I stop seeing all of this reactive stuff that's probably mostly in my own mind. And yeah, well, if I'm if you're advocating for anyone's rights, and I'm a, I'm a professional right. activist now, so I mean, and I'm I'm mostly advocating yeah. for atheists' rights, right? But but I mean, that is by definition social justice. So how does that one? How is that a negative that I'm looking out for? You know. For, for myself and for others like me who, you know, who hold this position, who aren't believers, how is that a negative? That, and when, what makes a social justice warrior? I mean, clearly, I don't think that that, that I've heard the term bandied about so, so uh, callously that I don't know that it has a definition. But when there is a, a when, when people do try to describe what they, you know, hate about social justice warriors, they're clearly not talking about me or anything remotely like anything I've ever done, but you know, they still throw out that term. And it's just like they want to put out all these other generalities at the same time. I mean, they, they, they start telling me about uh, how I'm a victim, which, you know, I've never been a victim at any point in my life, ever. Seriously, I don't, at least I don't feel that I've been a victim, you know, I certainly haven't I mean, been. We're, been... we're straight white guys, right? I mean, I'm assuming on your part, so like, <laughs> we're, we're fine, we're not playing the victim card here, you know? Uh, yeah, well, I've definitely never played the victim card, ever at all. And so people tell me, well, you need to get off to your, your safe space, Snowflake. I'm like, do you, no idea that, you know, I don't, I have, uh, I, I don't have a safe space. I don't need the, the a safe Snowflake space. The Snowflake label I find so ironic because, because it comes, it's thrown at us by the most oversensitive, overreactive people in the universe. Like you're calling me a <laughs> snowflake and I merely use the word feminism in a way clearly defined as something pretty mainstream. And you lose your ever-loving mind in a way that's clearly emotional and clearly about something else. Yeah. So, so like, then, I, won't, I don't want to be called a snowflake by people who can't hear words without just losing it. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. One time I was called out rather, rather loudly on this one. Uh, this, this one guy made a, made a video calling me out for uh, you know, saying, if it were that I were just, uh, that, that, I, that I just believed in equality, then I would be this person's uh, ally. And and yet, in the very video that he was criticizing, where I identified as a feminist, I said that this is an issue that we need to get past, so that we don't fight against each other pointlessly. You know, that this is not this is not our main focus. We have a common enemy, we have a common goal. You know, and that common enemy is, you know, well-armed and well-funded and, you know, there, and there's millions of them. So there's no, no, no reason for us to fight over relative trivialities when we should be focusing on how can we help. We don't have to agree with each other about everything. And that's another argument that I often heard was that 
the, if you're in right. my faction, or you know, then you then you have to be in lockstep right. with all these other people that are in part of that movement, and that there's no freedom of thought there. So anytime I was on stage with any of these people, I would make an announcement to the audience that I don't believe, I don't agree with this guy about everything. I don't agree with anyone about everything, and you don't have right. to. You know, I mean, I'm going to disagree, and I have significant disagreements right. with prominent people in the atheist movement. But those aren't the things that I'm concerned about. You know, we have, right. as I said, the common goal and the common enemy, and that person can still be an ally even if we have, right. you know, different views on, on social or political issues. Right. That doesn't matter, you know, compared to the, right. the common goal. And I don't understand why right. other people don't just rationally see that. Why why right. fixate on this whole argument that, you know, you used the F word or whatever, and so now right. I'm going to put all of this other trash on top of you and assume that you are the... Right. The, the snowflake SJW whatever else that they want to lob on. Yeah. When clearly that doesn't apply. No, and and I mean I on just this podcast I'm starting, you know, now, already have a pretty clear record of calling out the far left when they say something stupid. Like it's Oh not, absolutely. You know? Yeah, and I wanna I wanna say not... something about that too, because I, I catch a lot of hell for being on the left. You know, there was a time when I thought that I was uh, center left that I'm you know, more or less centrist, but on the left of that line. And I realized, no, I'm actually center of the left. I'm actually further left than I thought I was. But the thing is, it, it, that's unapologetic. I mean, I because I believe more in human rights than I do in corporate profits, then I end up in this position. I, you know, it's more about a, a compassion for humanity. Now I realize that there are people in my, in, in my little quadrant of the political uh, compass that that I don't agree with on about a lot of things, you know, and some of them may be even embarrassing people. But then when I look over on the, on the right, I got fuck all I can identify with over there. You know, so um, there's, there's a handful of people on, on the left, on my quadrant that I can say, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be associated with this person or that person. I don't want to be associated with fucking anyone over on the right. And that's, those people are powerful. And that's yeah. the difference that I think the, the people we're, arguing with here don't understand in that there's a bunch of liberals or leftists or whatever you want to call them protesting on college campuses who seem to be making complete jackasses of themselves i don't disagree but so what at the end of the day this is like a three percent problem um mike pence <laughs> yeah. is like a 90 percent problem yeah yeah and again if you look at a lot of the people, many of them leading atheists, who complain about the social justice warrior crowd, what they always say, there's been this big ruckus with Sam Harris recently, what they always say is, you're ascribing to me positions that I don't hold, these social justice warriors are just out to smear you, whatever, but then... As soon as you try and take a position with some sort of nuance with regards to social justice issues, the same people, um, I mean, I won't speak for Sam Harris, but the same people, the fan base certainly, um, immediately just turn around and just smear you with everything to the point where we've spent the first 30 minutes of this interview just digging ourselves out from under it. You know? Yeah. Yes, I'm a feminist. No, I don't hate all men. I am a man. I'm okay with that. I'm not chopping my own dick off or anything. I'm not calling for it anyone else mean to do what the you same. Think it, means. it doesn't mean what you think it means. I don't hold the position you think I hold. I actually agree with you on some things. I mean, yeah, it, and, and, and there's no, as I said, there's no nuance. There's no attempt at, at communication. But, for the longest time, every single video, I, and I mean for four or five years, every single video I uploaded, Within moments, you know, we had somebody right. posting anti-feminist crap. Absolutely every single video. It doesn't matter if it was a. It could be a a child's lesson in cellular mitosis, and I, all I've got is right. anti anti-feminist arguments. All of which are accusing me of saying or thinking or doing or being something that never applied, that I never said or did or thought or meant. Not not only that you never said or did or thought or meant, but something you explicitly disavowed in the original thing <laughs> that they're attacking you for in the first place. And exactly. this is what I got, because like, I think no one actually read my article. They just saw atheists should be feminists. And like, you know, I had a little nerd fit. Um, but like in my article, I explicitly said, 
I am totally anticipating some people are going to say, oh, but radical feminists, this, that, and the other. Here is what I mean by feminism. This is what it did. And it didn't help at all. Absolutely yeah. not at all. Here's, here's my next question for you, though. Is, do you think, how, how long ago was that talk that you did that? The, Five years. Do you think it's got better or worse since then? Because I think it's got worse. It did get worse. It got a lot worse. I don't think it's as bad now. Uh, but let's see. What do we? If, if you go back two years ago, is when I think it hit its peak. Hmm. It was it was the worst that it was going to get two years ago. And, and and the frustrating thing there is that we were really working against our own interests. There was uh, there was the Reason Rally 2016. Uh, that that was one of the it was meant to be something to advertise that hey atheists are a political demographic in Washington D.C. Come look at our numbers and you know you, you and we were trying to appeal to to. Uh, politicians to acknowledge us as a demographic and yet because organizers had chosen a handful of right-wing anti-feminists but they also included someone who identified as a feminist well then suddenly the all of the the, the, the alt-right people started saying well this is a feminist event clearly you know, a number of these other speakers being anti-feminist themselves obviously did not make this a feminist event, but it was it was boycotted hugely by by large YouTube channels. And so what we ended up with was, uh, it, it, for a number of reasons, actually, uh, we, we ended up with uh, like a fraction of the, the, the population that we were meaning to get. And this is all because we were working against our own interests. Why? Would we not want to be recognized as a as a as a as a as a political demographic of significant numbers, you know? So there was no reason to do that. It's it it only undermines. Yeah, and what, even what if these yeah, even what, if what not, even these channels have been trying to do. Yeah, but even if you're not going to say I'm a feminist, you want to be a politically conservative. Why go out and create fights just needlessly? Why? It seems to me like there's a whole bunch of movements in this country that are separate but overlapping, almost like a big Venn diagram, that you know revolve around different identities and different interest groups. So in terms of identities, you've got like women's rights movements, you've got gay rights movements, you've got um, the Black Lives Matter has obviously become very prominent. And then you've got interests to do with, say, the environment, to do with money and politics, to do with whatever. And Atheism as a movement, it seems to me like from when I first became politically aware as an atheist, maybe 15 years ago, something like that, maybe 10, I don't know, we were sort of nominally centre-left if you had to put a centre of gravity to it. And it seems like not only have we drifted towards the right, but we've systematically, not just that we don't overlap a little bit with any of those other groups, but some of our more prominent commentators and certainly the followers online have almost made it their business to burn every goddamn bridge. And then we wonder why we're politically irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, because we're, because we're doing it to ourselves, definitely. There's something gratuitous there, right? Like this, well, this, yeah, uh, what, I saw an explanation about this. I mean, one of them, one of the uh, originally alt-right people made a video where he was saying that, that uh, he, was, he was himself personally making over ten thousand dollars a month by doing anti-feminist rhetoric that this is the thing that that was making him his money and he says that there were a number of other channels that were bigger than him that were making profoundly more money than he was but he you know he was making i mean think about it over ten thousand dollars a month just because you're doing this hot button issue and he uh, he lost a lot of his following and he said you know, during the the last election the 2016 election he said you know what maybe you know, feminists are, are a problem. Yeah, we have to do something about feminists. But you know what? They're not the worst problem we're facing right now. There are other issues we should probably be focusing on. And there, and there, his channel was bombed because he said that. You know, and I'm, I'm sorry, but that's that's correct. There are more significant. The feminists are not the ones who are in charge of absolutely everything in this country. They're not the ones forcing legislation on everything in this country. They're not undermining everything that we're doing. There are other issues that we actually do have that are more profound than whatever your complaint with some college protester is. But for he become he he comes out and says this, and then he just like lost. He just hemorrhaged subscribers, and so he's not making that money anymore. But that still requires an explanation, though, right? Because there is so 
clearly a market for this. There's a market for hating on feminists. There's a market for hating on the college kids. There's a market for hating on social justice causes in general. And you see this now, I've heard the term bandied about somewhat pretentiously, the, the quote, intellectual dark web, where you have people who I kind of can quite like in some moods, like Sam, Sam Harris, say, to people who I'm not at all sure about, like someone like Jordan Peterson, you've got people on the right like Ben Shapiro, you've got the the Weinsteins, or not the Weinsteins, but the, the all the, like a range of different people, but what unites them and what seems to draw people to them is just an implacable hatred of social justice and political correctness that I think lacks any sort of nuance. And all of them have like interesting things to say on other topics, but what seems to be drawing people to them is people are willing to listen to and to fund anybody who can in an articulate way just shit all over anyone working for social justice anyone who is um, anti-PC, and I don't know, like, like what, one, what do you make of that? And two, why is that? Why is there such a market for that? I, I don't understand the anti-PC thing either, because, I mean, while I, I don't myself make uh, any special provisions for, for anybody's feelings. I mean, I, I, I really I don't know if I would qualify as PC or not. I'm never trying to be a dick to somebody, but then neither do I walk on eggshells. You know, it, it's, it's, it is as if there's an impression that, uh, that there, there's a PC thing, there's like a, a PC police thing. I think I've heard that term. Where really you, you've got a very small group of people that are trying to be sensitive to somebody else's feelings. And they're not controlling everything, but they're being portrayed as if they're controlling and enforcing you know, how you speak or whatever. Again, this is just not something I was ever concerned about, so I, I never did this myself. I mean, at most, I mean, if somebody if if, if somebody wants to identi be identified as a as a as a, as a, uh, a as an, a different gender than what their outward appearance or birth certificate might be, I would I could accommodate wow. that. You know, I mean, so is that PC? Is that is that what the problem is? I would I mean, how say that's that, just basic decency. It's like well, how can that be the how can that be a problem? And so why are we so why are we so upset about whatever the hell they think these PC things are? Other people are really fascinated in, in, in going into everything that they can find wrong with political correctness or with the, with, with, with um, social justice or with feminism or whatever. These are just not issues that I invest any time in. Where does that come from? Why is there a market for just hating on feminism? Why is there a market for hating on people who aren't that bad? I mean, even if they are, are completely powerless, why is it? And it's, it's recent as well. This, this feels like in the last 10 years, it just has become this thing of being very, very upset and offended that some kid on a college campus did something that you don't like. Like, what's, what's driving this, dude? Well, it, we're, we're very definitely getting different news. Mm. You know, I mean, there, there's people in my family, if, they, if, if I go where they live... I will I will see Fox News and I will see other new I'll see them watching other news sources and all of their statistics are like the same charts that I have turned upside down. You know, so that such that, that you know that uh, somehow the the job market and the economy were all better under Bush than under Obama and it's like it it's like every upswing is a downturn somehow, and it just they don't know. Anything that I know that I see in my regular news feed all the time, they don't know any of that. Never heard of any of it. And cons and conversely, I've never heard of whatever bullshit they're talking about. You know, I mean, and when they tell me that you know that uh, global warming is a hoax and that the, the planet is actually getting colder every year, it only takes an instant to pull up on you know, on any the, on their computer to show you know here here's the actual data. It's exactly opposite of what you just said, but you're never going to change their mind. No. Somehow, Obama is a socialist, foreign-born Muslim 
and there's and there's no amount of they have nothing to go on to indicate that and no amount of proof will ever correct it i don't know how, what to do with that yeah and it's the same with the feminism stuff is one of the questions I ask, and if people who do feel this way have made it this far with us, well, first of all, congratulations, you made it 40 minutes. Um, but secondly, I always ask, where are you pulling this from? Because what they always say, well, what I see from feminism is dot, 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 man-hating, whatever. And I say, but are you seeing this as some feminist being cited in a right-wing news source? Are you seeing this online? Or is this your day-to-day -day experience with women who apparently, identify as feminists? Because yeah, apparently, if you if you go searching hard enough, you can find some wackadoo who says almost any crazy thing. But no movement, no ideology, no belief system will stand up to being judged by the stupidest thing that someone has said in its name online. Atheism <laughs> certainly won't be. <laughs> Yeah, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's a bar that nobody will meet. And I think atheists should be aware of this, because often when you, you, you know, you get so many hit pieces on atheism that are really just um, combed Christopher Hitchens at his worst and found times when, you know, I never knew Hitch, but... He, he clearly was deliberately provocative and offensive at times, and they just take that and are like, this is what atheists believe. And you can, but you can do that with anything, and I, I would ask people to think that they are doing that with feminists. Yes, there's some really weird stuff that you can find on the internet, but that's true for anything. The, the, the question is, is, is that representative of the whole? And I, don't, I really don't see that it is in feminism, whereas you take the religious right, particularly the evangelical right in this country, the Looney Tunes stuff is the whole. That is the norm in that form of discourse, in that ideology. And I've, I've noted a number of times that, you know, with, there's this purist thing, which I, which I don't get. And, I, and while I often hear, you know, from people on the, alt, on the right or alt-right, you know, they, they say that their purists are on the left and so that they're creating this problem, I actually see it, of course, on the right as well. Where it and I, I see it on the right more often, where everything you did or everything I've ever seen you do up to this point has been something I could spot on agree with, but now I have this one thing you said that I disagree with, and now I must campaign against everything you ever do for the rest of your life. Yeah, this is what I get from the people on the right, and this is the very thing they're complaining about from people on the left. Yeah, and then the other question I ask is, do you think? that there are any differences socially. Because one thing I hear all the time is, well, how dare you talk about women's rights in America? Don't you care at all about women's rights in Saudi Arabia? And you can, I mean, this is a pretty simple question to answer. I feel like you can care about both. You can acknowledge that there's a difference. Obviously, women in Saudi Arabia are treated worse. But that doesn't imply... There's no logical connection from saying women are in Saudi Arabia are treated worse to saying there are still significant social differences in America, and that's a problem. So, so what you're saying is if you believe in that the women should have social, political, and economic equality, you're saying that you believe that they should have that in Saudi Arabia, and they should have it here. And if they have it here more than they have it there, then you should still believe that they should have it here, Right. Because people are saying, well, if they have if they have it here more than they do there, then you should stop caring about it here. Why? Yeah. <laughs> and that, I don't... that doesn't make any sense. And we've actually got people, you know, uh, high-ranking political people. I mean, there's a couple of senators now that I've heard from that that say that women need to get out of the workforce and stay at home and raise and raise families, and that that's their place. There's senators, state yeah. senators, who are saying this. Yeah. So, you know, don't tell me that, that they have, you know, that there's this social acceptance of political equality. No, there is not. Still, there are people in the, in the 1950s perspective on that. Yeah, and there's sort of like also just this thing called statistics in that the, the, if you really think men and women have perfect equality in America... Let's just look at um, how likely you are to be sexually assaulted or raped. It's it's not as if it never happens the other way round. But I would say 
almost every woman I know has some sort of Me Too story. Not not rape exactly, but everyone has had some guy do something really weird or nasty to her. Um, Mm -hmm. And that's just a reality that I don't live with um and, you know. and when you say that you know you, you've got to acknowledge because somebody's always going to say well what about you know and and try to to come up with the, the, the rare exception to that as if that makes the standard somehow well that's bad too what about men who get sexually assaulted yes it does happen and that's horrible particularly actually one of the reasons i've been very passionate for prison reform is to the extent that men do get sexually assaulted or raped that the majority of that happens inside u.s prisons and that's a huge thing that we need to be honest about and stop treating as a joke and to take seriously um but you can care about two things and just like with saudi arabia you can recognize that the scale of one thing is bigger than the scale of the other i i i I don't and also, and then there's one one other thing that I need yeah. to throw out there, and this comes up often. If you actually talk to to somebody about this, they, they will invariably come up with, uh, you know, court cases that have you know favored women over men, like in child custody and that sort of mm-hmm. thing. And you know, the opposite perspective that I get is that you know, when uh, there was a time when uh, I found myself involved in a in a uh, there was a child custody case. <laughs> And I'm I'm participating in this, and the 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 legal firm said because it was in Texas, they said that the man cannot file that they, they would not even take a case if the man had filed. They would only take it if if someone else has filed against him. Then they have kind of an obligation to do that, but not if he wants to file because the man will never win. It was Texas in 1980s or in early 90s, and so the man always loses. And uh, that, and, and then at the time, I remember the, the lawyers were talking about, but that may change because it was a feminist protest against always assuming that the, the idea that the woman is the is the mother and that that's the way it should be. So I mean, the feminists were actually advocating for men's rights as fathers, and the result of that was that in Texas, a couple of years later, it changed completely, so that it, it's now you have an equal shot. That um, that that you you end up with joint custody anyway, you know the the way this uh, t- the state rules on those family court issues completely changed. I mean it doesn't it, it wasn't to the point where you know men always win, uh, in the because in most of the cases it seems statistically the men don't actually contest it, but in the contested cases or when the men do contest it, they actually have a statistical advantage now. And otherwise, it's a it's a joint custody situation. So, I mean, I have to appreciate the the feminist protest that actually got us a, a more equal treatment, where it was absurd before. If you're a man, you're just you're just the loser. You're just going to pay a bunch of child support and not have any rights. That's the way it was before the feminist protest. That's really interesting, actually, because yeah, I was going to say there are there are some areas where arguably women are advantaged over men. Probably the most obvious would be um, child custody. Um, But yeah, I don't think there's any contradiction in, well, there's not only not a contradiction, there's just a logical coherence in saying, well, yeah, if there are cases where women are advantaged over men, then we want to think about that and rectify it. And I'm glad to hear actually feminists made the right call on that one. The other one, which is where I do really begin to feel that some of these people are badly motivated is as soon as you say men and women have equality, and this this has happened enough times that I'm convinced it's a thing, is they say, well, does that mean I get to hit women? You know, I, 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 I can I hit a man back haven't. if he hits me. Does that mean I can hit a woman back? And it's like, that's where your mind went with that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I haven't heard that particular one, but I've heard things that were just about as bad. As I said, the, the arguments that I've heard have been somewhat less than convincing. I mean, just, just, just deplorable arguments. I mean, you obviously haven't thought this through. Um, but anyway, it, it all, most of it comes down to where they have to see things as an opposite dichotomy. And the one thing you disagree with means that if you disagree on one thing, that means you have to disagree on absolutely everything else, and that person becomes your enemy, where you know we used to be allies or whatever, and so we have to have these hard divisions. And the, the very people doing that are also the people who are complaining that that's happening. They're the ones doing it, and yeah. they're complaining that that's happening. 
on all of this, there's a level of hypocrisy that's really like, how close do we need to hold the mirror to you? Because atheists complain about being strawmanned. They complain that their opponents are taking them out of context or at their worst. They complain that their opponents are overly pure or ideologically dogmatic. Like, but then the way they behave with respect to feminists, like, you're, you're projecting so hard we could point you at a wall and run PowerPoint out on you. Like, this is just, how are you not recognizing the same behavior when you do it? That's what I find really galling in all of this. And that was actually my point in this original article that got me in trouble, was not that um, you have to be a feminist or atheism logically implies feminism. It's we're dealing with very similar struggles here, and we are not helping ourselves by doing it to each other. And while people on the social justice left have not always been fair to atheists, I think we've actually been the instigators of a lot of this stuff and starting big online fights and brawls and, you know, hating on feminism in a way that has obviously made feminists hate us in return. Well, there's an awful lot of hate. That's, that's going around online. I mean, and, and it's easy for a lot of people that are that have anonymity, and even those who put themselves out there and are not anonymous, there's still a, a hate market. Mm. And and the big biggest detachment I have is that I just I just don't hate like they do. I mean, I've often said the only thing I hate are lies and liars, mm. and I'm pretty much done there. I mean, that's really it. So, I mean, uh, everybody I can think of, everybody that I look up to, you mentioned Hitchens. I've got a couple significant disagreements with Hitchens, but that doesn't that doesn't diminish my respect for the man, you know, where we agree or as, you know, where he could serve me as an ally. The same thing goes with just about anybody. Right. You know, I mean, there, uh, Sam Harris, you brought up him before. I mean, why well, have disagreements with him? And there's other things that I'm proud of him for. I mean, it's the same with everyone. And we have to we have to understand, you know, people are are people essentially and and nobody's going to agree on everything and you kind of you can't be that you can't hold this purest position because then you're going to be completely without allies it's like this i remember when somebody had a had a poster in their wall that said you know he who refuses to accept anything but the very best very often gets it and i remember thinking no that's an opposite philosophy if you refuse to accept anything but the very best understanding that whatever you get there's always something better then you're not going to have anything you know, and, and so, <laughs> you know, will this serve me is, is you know, more than what you should be asking. But as a final question for the, for the interview, though, um, you said something to the effect of you'll be cut off and without any allies. It seems increasingly that is where atheism is, and it's done it to itself in a way that's just completely gratuitous and unnecessary. And it hasn't changed my atheism. I haven't suddenly started thinking, well, you know, maybe there was this talking snake. It has changed my enthusiasm for wanting to go to atheist meetings or whatever. It has changed how much I want to talk about it. Um, where do we go from here? Because I, you know, what what is the future? Because I've always argued in a way that people are going to say, you're an atheism plus, whatever the fuck that is. Um, I've always argued we do broadly want to be allies with a lot of these groups. Doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. But one thing I think neither side understands is atheists are a historically persecuted community in exactly the same way that women are. Or not exactly the same way, but in similar ways that women are, or black people are, or gay people are. You know, non-believers were burned alive for thousands of years, and within living memory, people got fired for atheism from departments. And to this day, we still really can't get elected to any major office in this country. And there's a huge stigma against us. So with we should generally be... I've always argued allies to other people who are battling the lasting effects of historical discrimination. One, because it's the right thing to do. Two, because as much as we're cozying up to the alt-right right now, and as much as that seems to be the direction, at no point is Mike Pence going to turn around and say, atheists get a seat at the table. That is not. Yeah, well, I don't. I don't see us moving. Honestly, I don't see us moving uh, alt right. While there's a, a large contingent of atheists, 
the, the, the issue is, is that atheism is on the rise in all 50 states. Mm. Okay, and so that, and we're not all going to agree. So we're going to have every faction represented. You know, if if we were the entire country, we would have you know every, every faction that currently exists would still exist within the atheism movement, or community, if you want to call it that. And um, the problem is the negativity. Yes, there's a there's a market for that, and it's there's a lot of channels that are dedicated to ponage that just want to take something somebody said and show that it's wrong, and Everybody says something that's wrong, so there's going to be an undying market for that. But the thing is, is it's too easy to do that. I know huge channels that do nothing but negative attacks on whatever, whether it's political or scientific or whatever. They'll, they'll, they'll say, well, this, do, this won't work for X reason, and, and this is where you're wrong. But as I said, that, that's too easy to do. So it's much harder to, uh, to, to find somebody who's actually trying to fix things and not just has a solution. I mean, that, that's a huge challenge right there. But you know, I want to talk to the people who are actually doing something to make things better. So, I mean, the podcast that I do, the Raw Man podcast, is where I try to focus on or I try to spotlight someone who's actually making a difference, who's actually taking action to make things better. And that is a direct opposite of what I mostly see in the atheist community. I want to start promoting, and this is speaking personally now, I start promoting the, uh, the the positive aspects of atheism. I, I'm a science advocate. I, I'm uh, all about education. I uh, I I am. I, I I renewed my membership with the American Humanist Association. I, I want to. Although I'm part of the Atheist Out program, and I will primarily identify as an atheist, I am a humanist also. You know, and I'm a secularist and a skeptic, and and I'm, I am I'm trying to embody all of these things that I see as the positive aspects of really humanity. You don't have to be atheist to be skeptical or secular or humanist and so on, but we embody those traits more than anyone else, so that they become like almost typical of our perspective. And so that's that's what I'm that's that's where I'm going. I don't know where the movement is going, but I know where I'm going. Well, there's the, the people in the movement, so atheism is on the rise, but it feels like there was a high watermark with atheism maybe five to ten years ago where it became really, really prominent and there were the so-called new atheists. And then, I don't know, as like a movement, as an organizing capacity, as an ability to like get people out into big rallies and like have an agenda we're advancing, do you do you feel we're as strong now as we were five years ago? Well, we're never going to be if we're only if we're not unified. If we're going to continue to squabble with each other about any any social or political difference, then we're not. We're only going to have our individual successes if that's it. But I mean, that, then that just goes to the next question, which is going to be: Are we just going to continue to squabble? Because I do not see. You know, we'll see. We'll put this. I'm going to put this out and share it on social media or whatever, and we'll see what people say about it. But I know what they're going to say about it. I don't see as. I, I think we really went through and tried to present the arguments in advance that we know we're going to encounter here. I. I don't know, I hope to be wrong, but I just see this implacable hatred of feminists continuing. I see an implacable hatred of social justice types continuing. And then I see social justice types and feminists sort of returning the favor to us. I don't, I don't know that you can rebuild bridges that have been that thoroughly burnt, or are you more optimistic? I would say that I'm more optimistic in that we uh, I would call these growing pains mm. you know and and yeah we're we're always going to have political differences but at the same time uh, religion is not going to recover from from what's happening to it right now you know it, minor resurgences are all that's going to happen but as far as as far as religion having political power in this country it is diminishing we are gaining more acceptance politically or we will have more acceptance politically it's it'll be certain factions within atheism maybe individual successes as i said before not necessarily a movement success because i mean how you if we can't unify then we're just going to have to go individually but we neither of us sound hugely optimistic about the unification but then again well, no i'm not i'm not i'm not uh, uh, because what makes 
atheists unify. And uh, this is why when I go to when I go to Washington State or if I go to New York, uh, Chicago or whatever, uh, people will ask me why I'm why I am an atheist activist. But people in the South, Arizona to Florida, they understand right. why I'm an atheist activist because they, uh, because every level of government is dominated by you know right wing fundamentalist Christian dominionists who think these are the end times. Yeah. You know, and they're all extremists. Well, now that we have Mike Pence as your vice president, you know, in the, in the current political scheme, now the people in New York are starting to understand why I've always been an, an activist up to this point. That's you know, really it had true. to get this extreme. And but as yeah. as religion loses power, then the the atheist activists will lose their sense of urgency. Because that, I mean, this is why we have so many atheist activists in Texas, in particular. You know, you go to the places where the religion has the most extreme power, and that's where you've got the most extreme opposition. Right. And one other thing I'd add to that is, geographically, there's regions where um, atheists, it's everyone's just sort of like, doesn't get it. And then obviously within the South, you're right. The thing I'd add to it, which will make everyone call me a social justice warrior again, is I would say the same thing is true within different... Um, ethnic, racial, social groups. So for me, as a white, middle-class, straight man who lives in New York, it's pretty easy to be an atheist. For um, my wife, for instance, who's a working-class Dominican immigrant, to come out to her family as an atheist is considered... And these are, I'm not saying that they're liberal within that culture. Um, but that that's considerably less accepted and more challenging there. And I think there is a need, which we're completely neglecting, to empower and to give voice to and to pull up atheists within um, more disadvantaged, maybe disadvantaged is the wrong word, but less, less um, not, not the dominant, cult, the less dominant cultural groups within the country. And that's one thing I'm going to try and do with my podcast is give give a platform to people who are doing that work, which I think is very important and I think is, um, you know, atheism within the black community, atheism within the Muslim community, so on and so forth, which is, I think, is something that we, I mean, not we, us two, but we as an atheist movement have neglected. And I don't, I don't want in 10 years it to still be something that's predominantly white men. I think that that would be an unfortunate result. Yeah, well, as I, as I understand it, you know, demographics do change. Yeah. You know, and and the white male dominance is is uh, fading. Uh, white Christian evangelicals, for example, they they were a, a dominant force, and now they're I think in the last couple of days, they've now been declared to be a, a minority for the first time. And if you go back in this country, if you look back a couple hundred years ago, the demographics look very different than they do. If you go back three or four hundred years ago, yes. they're dramatically different <laughs> than they are now. So yeah, and and a lot of these, a lot of the people that we have a problem with, are people that don't realize that things change. That they're, and especially when we're talking about conservatives, let's keep things the way they were. Let's keep them like the good old days, you know. And and they don't understand that the things are changing. And there's not going to be, those good old days are not going to continue. Yeah. yeah, and to an extent never even existed to begin yep. with. Um, someone was telling me a while ago they wish they could have lived in the 1800s and going on and on and on. And just, I just said surgery without anesthetic. Like, <laughs> is this, that's really what you're pining for? But yeah, I mean... <laughs> I wonder... Yeah, death by syphilis. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Six of your nine children die in their first five years, you know, like... Um, you don't even name the child until it's two. Yeah. Because um, you don't want to build an attachment. <laughs> but do you think that is where a lot of this is coming from? That, that, that There's something irrational at the heart of hatred of feminism, right? Is it a fear of change? Because social norms are changing, and at some level people are just threatened by it. I also think, and I don't want to be personal or ad hominem, there is just a degree of hatred of women and a sort of sexual frustration that lies behind it all. The, I, I, mean, I, I don't know where that's coming from, and I, I, and I, I just I don't know how to relate to that. Uh, likewise, the, the race thing. I don't, I don't understand where the, 
you know, I've, I've heard people say, or I, let, me, let me put it a different way. I've seen studies that show that, you know, the, that when you blend the, the, for the, the largest gene pool, you're going to get the greatest advantage of them. And, right. and that the purebred is actually the weaker strain. So anybody that wants to keep their bloodlines pure is actually going to end up weak because of it. And, but if you're, if you're racially intermixed, which doesn't, doesn't even make sense when you remember that we all start out from the same, same collective anyway. Uh, and that there is no no scientifically determinable issue of race. Right. There, there's just not a racial distinction. And Darwin argued that there is no such thing as race. I mean, so that's how old that concept is. Um, people will tell me that if you if you mix, then you have white genocide. The hell what is white the genocide? Fuck, are they talking about? Yeah, and, and why why would it matter to you if generations from now? Uh, if, if, if you if you can't declare a certain population of, of white people, I mean, who the hell acts like that? I mean, where is there anybody saying that, that they need to have, preserve this particular race in perpetuity without any changes? Because we know that things change. Every demographic changes. And what you can't the stop that. Would it matter if in five hundred years we were all beige skinned? Like, what? How would that be an ethical problem? <laughs> I'm gonna, yeah, no, I'm, I remember saying that that, um, that, that the recessive genes for uh, uh, green-eyed, red-haired women, that would be a sad thing if that went away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, I can't, I can't have any more emotional attachment to that. You know, it, it just does, those uh, among the many things that don't matter <laughs> to me at all. But it's a thing. So I'm going to do something I don't normally do in the podcast, is I'll talk about my personal life a little bit, is... I'm married to, I mean, a mixed race marriage, right? And people say funny things about it still, like living in liberal New York and God knows what it would be like if I lived in the South or something. And so I play a little game in my head where because I'm British living in America, people assume certain bullshit things about me, right? And if I say that I'm married, they ask, where's your wife from? Reasonable question. And I play a little game. I flip a coin in my head and I sometimes say she grew up in New York, which is true. And I sometimes say she's Dominican, which is also true, right? And if I say she grew up in New York, oh, okay, that's nice. If I say she's Dominican, people, at least half the time, pull their heads back a little and make a really surprised face and go, oh, like that. Oh. And I've had people say to me stuff like, one guy said to me, you two are going to have some funny looking children. I said, fuck you, buddy. You know? Uh, and my wife. My wife, coincidentally, is uh, she's uh, also mixed. Right? She has Vietnamese ancestry. And I heard a comedian talking about the, the way that people are categorized is whatever other element you have that dilutes the white becomes what you are. So you may be half white and half anything else, but it's the anything else that you're identified as. So she's identified as Asia, Asian, even though she's never been to Asia. Right. You know, and and people assume that she speaks other languages, or that she uh, that she's she's Im immigrated here to get our jobs, or what have you. Or she grew up here, she was born here, you know. But everybody thinks she's an immigrant. You know, it, it's and it's it's a ridiculous way to to, to generalize people. And there's there's a wonderful quote from of all people, Papadoc, the Haitian dictator where some journalist asked him a question, what's it like to govern a majority black country? Kind of implicitly racially loaded question. And mm -hmm. Papadoc says, Haiti's a majority white country. And the journalist says, how on earth do you figure that? And Papadoc says, what's your definition of black? And the journalist says, well, someone who has a black ancestor. And he says, well, that's my definition of white, someone who has a white ancestor. And if you take <laughs> that definition, then Haiti is a majority white country. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that's not the general practice, as we said. You know, it's whatever that dilutes the white is what you end up being, and no other race is like that. So, yeah, it's 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 rather embarrassing that we are that way. That's just bullshit. And, and the marriage that I have, yeah, uh, would have been illegal. I uh, had in the age that I was born. Yes, it was illegal for me to have married someone 
who has Vietnamese ancestry. Isn't that amazing? Well, what was it? Was Loving versus Virginia? I don't have it in front of me, but I think yeah, it was. It what, was. And what was that? that was a social justice issue. Yeah. You know, these crazy <laughs> social justice snowflakes, right? Oh, um, the damn marriage equality. <laughs> I know. Um, I, I believe in the year that Loving versus Virginia passed, it applied to 13 states, mostly in the South, still had anti-mixed marriage laws. But even in the remaining states where it was legal, there was only 27 interracial marriages in that year. And that's, that's within living memory. That's, that's I, I think... When people are like, oh, social justice warriors, you're overreacting, you did, 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 you know, within living memory, both of our marriages would have been illegal. That's a really yeah. crazy thought. Um, I don't know. How far we've come. Yeah. Should we leave it there? Yeah, I think so. That's a good talk, man. Thank you for doing this. My pleasure. Um, before we go, any Twitter feed, website, uh, whatever you'd like listeners to follow you at? Uh, I think uh, I'd already mentioned, I think, uh, everything I do is supported by Patreon. So, uh, you know, patreon.com forward slash A-R-O-N-R-A. Mm -hmm. I do need all the support I can get because this is my full-time gig. Yeah. And, uh, I, yeah, it, it, involves, uh, it involves a lot of travel and I do a lot of political activism as well. I, I, I have been... Uh, I've given testimony at the state house. I've you know stood on the steps of the state capitol with picket signs many many times over, and um, that's kind of what I'm about now. So if anyone wants to support that, you're welcome to my YouTube channel, of course, A R O N R A, uh, R N R A. Write it as two names. Google me. I'm, I should come up pretty quick. Cool. And thanks for this chat because it did remind me. I think I felt a lot less passionate about building up atheism as a movement. I think talking to you did remind me of like, even if some atheists are complete jack offs, it is still something that I believe in. So thank you for this talk. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs>